good evening good morning i think people from different parts of the world will join this seminar so this seminar is organized by ieee new south wales censor council chapter as a part of the distinguished lecturer program and this is the second distinguished lecture we are organizing in 2021 i have the pleasure to introduce professor arokya nathan professor arokya nathan is a professor in cambridge university he is a uh, by fellow and tutor at darwin college he has very illustrious career i do not want to read everything but i just want to mention few things he has written over 600 papers four books and most important is he has 100 over 110 patents and four spin up companies which is just wonderful and staggering number of course he is a fellow of ieee and a distinguished lecturer of ieee censor council if anybody is interested to know his long bio please have a look in the in our announcement he is the leading pioneer in the development and application of thin film transistor technologies to flexible electronics display and sensor systems today he will be sharing with us integration strategies to meet low power requirements of biosensor interfaces the floor is your arokya please take over thank you very much thanks, uh, thanks subhas thanks a uh, very generous <laughs> introduction there and so the one thing i want to clarify is that i'm um, i have been a professor at cambridge and a lot of my a lot of technologies came out of my lab and as i'm heading towards retirement i told myself let me switch careers and become entrepreneurial and so i left and i'm pretty much full time running my companies but i managed you know to continue supervising students at darwin college so so that's my uh, so darwin is part of cambridge university but i'm no longer faculty at cambridge so i wanted to clarify that so so my uh, talk today can you all hear me properly uh, can you hear me subhas yes yes i can hear you properly thank yeah, you so good no problem yeah so um uh, this is a sensor council distinguished lecture i don't want to try and uh, i try to reduce the amount of transistor physics or transistor technology that one can introduce but one of the important things um when you do have a, a sensor is to try and minimize the power and especially with self generating sensors um you know you try and um, have sensor interfaces that can function at super low power for two reasons one is of course to try and save on battery and the other is of course you know low power means low currents low voltages and um, and so sensor resolutions can be much better in that sense and if the uh, currents are low noise is low as well so you could get good resolution signal noise ratios out of the uh, sensor reading that you are trying to do so let me start with uh, because of the fact that one of the attractive areas that you could use this technology is in wearables uh, because wearables run off batteries or through energy harvesting so i'm going to you know just give you a, a very quick snapshot of flexible electronics technologies look at basic material properties look at transistors that could land up as uh, sensor interfaces and um, and then um, you know talk about the quest for low power when you have newly emerging applications and here is where the um, ultra low power is where i try to operate the sensor interface at the near off state in other words the transistor is actually asleep but it doesn't mean it's dead and uh, how can we then build a little circuit around that because it's still able to process very weak or very low currents and that brings me to this whole idea of what's the right architecture for this and that's the short key barrier uh interface so so uh, so that's the generic outline i should take about 30 to 40 minutes for the talk but i want to leave as much time possible for the uh, for the uh, questions and interactions i'm just checking my time <laughs> okay um right so 
So flexible, you know, when we look at flexible electronics, there has been the historically there has been a big push, and a lot of the silicon-based technologies are now virtually, you know, um, they started off with a lot of excitement because um, uh, you know everyone thought that silicon could, you know, land up in the flexible electronics area. Uh, but if you look at current products um, in flexible electronics. Uh, and that are, you know, this foldable display is the first ever product that's come out. That's all built on oxides. Oxides are nice um, and, and, and simply because they are super thin. So the channel layers and transistor, basically the cross section, the layers that you see in the cross section of a transistor are very, very thin and naturally allows you to have them, you know, um, uh, you know integrated in a, in a flexible substrate. The temperatures you use to make such devices are also very low. So that means that, you know, with sub 100 or 150, maximum 200 degrees, you can get a full high performance transistor fabricated on something flexible. Organics have always been the ultimate, you know, technology for the flexible because organics, you know, as you know, made out of plastic. So, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so it's naturally, you know, something that everyone thinks that it's suitable. I still believe it is, but I also believe that one has to be very careful how one applies it uh, because, you know, it's a new, relatively new material, perhaps, you know, 30 years, something along the lines of about 30 years old, essentially. Um, and what you really want out of, for me, as far, as far as, you know, designing a good sensor interface is concerned, it's very important to have a very wide band gap. A wide band gap means a low thermalization current. So if you look at silicon, it's 1.1 electron volts, has a lower, th uh, you know, it has got a higher thermalization current than, uh, than for example, a uh, gallium arsenide, which is 1.45 electron volts. Yeah, and um, so that low dark current is extremely important because that sets the noise limit for the sensory signal you're trying to read. And uh, stability is also something extremely important. And you know, the, the other attributes are things like high electron mobility, low temperature processability, transparency is an option. And if you had transparent materials, which wide band gaps tend to be, uh, tend to be, um, you know, sorry about something. Uh, tend to be, uh, you know, transparent because of the white band gap, then, um, you know, it, it's an option. Like this is an example where you can integrate everything on glass. And, you know, so these are application areas that could be attractive for the future. So here is, uh, you know, sort of a depiction of what ultra low power electronics means from the standpoint of a sensor interface. So a sensor interface is, is definitely, you know, it's 99% of the time made out of transistors. Now, can one use transistors out of a silicon chip to connect directly to your sensor? I wouldn't say no. I think there are applications where, uh, you know, that sensory signal goes directly onto a chip, uh, but these are very unique applications in the sense that that, that sensory signal, you know, trying to sense a large signal. You know, when you send a large signal, you know, a large current or a large voltage, you could feed it directly to a silicon chip. That silicon chip is still silicon uh, flexible compatible, simply because all you need is one millimeter of it. And when you fold and flex, one millimeter is not going to affect the folding or the flexing or the stretching per se. And chip on flex is a, is, has become quite an established technology now, you know. And so, so definitely that is something that you can do. However, if your sensory signal is weak and you want you know, to kind of harness a good signal noise ratio, then you can't afford to take the signal out of the wearable device. You've got to interface it directly on the wearable device, for example. And, um, and that way you overcome all of the parasitic capacitances that you're going to face with bonding pads that you will normally face when you take the signal out to a chip. So that's why, you know, that's the whole idea of having a low power sensory interface right next to the sensor. And when you talk about a low power sensory interface, essentially that transistor 
you know, uh, you can take, take a look at that transistor and say, where is that transistor sitting in terms of its operation mode? If you go right, that's the virtually off state. In other words, if you look at the currents in a transistor, then you get smaller and smaller values. So that means the transistor is approaching the off state. But if you went to the left, as you see here, and this is what, the, what we call the above threshold regime where the transistor is in the fully on state. And this is the state that's used for digital logic and also for you know, high amplification, simply because the you have a current that's independent of voltage. And so it's, it, this is the regime of you know, uh, using it as a stable current source. So here, you know, at, at voltage values on the gate that are much larger than the threshold voltage, that's what gives you the high power, high speed application areas like displays, like if you went out and bought a uh, OLED TV, uh, one of these LG or Samsung TVs, they're all operating in this regime as far as the driver of the organic light emitting diode is concerned. This is a fairly new um, sort of regime that we have discovered in thin film transistors. Um, and, 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 you know, they have been reported for silicon subthreshold regime uh, operation in silicon, and I'll show you some, 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 some data later. Um, but the attractiveness of using a white band gap material is that the currents can be very low. So if you take an oxide transistor, uh, the off-state current is extremely, extremely small, way smaller than any sensory current that, that comes out of, you know, a low, a low uh, output response sensor. So this is ultimate, you know, it's a very nice PowerPoint schematic, you know, and you can put anything on a PowerPoint, right, as you know, but this would be what we'd like to do. So this is something that we wear and it's got all the, all the sensors. The sensors can be as simple as an electrode and then it feeds into high impedance, you know, amplification stages. And this amplification stages are things that we'd like to integrate using a transistor, a TFT, thin film transistor. It's fully compatible, you know, to be, to be placed or fabricated or integrated right next to the sensor. And, uh, and then this becomes the external interface circuits that you can, that you can use. And, uh, and that interface circuits can contain analog to digital, you know, sort of uh, functions as well as Bluetooth functions to transmit that sensory signal to, to the cloud or to, to your phone, essentially. So, so low power, low, low power, uh, sorry, low voltage, low power is crucial because these things can be uh, operated by, um, you know, by battery or through energy harvesting. So, so sensitivity and battery lifetime are two very important things when designing the sensor system. So with this in mind is where we were thinking along the lines of how to turn off state, close to off state devices into active, you know, electronics that can be interfaced to the sensor. So, you know, so this brings us to the, you know, the very, very basics of the operating regimes of a transistor for an, for an ultra low power sensor interface. So, so uh, the one thing is that transistor should be operated in the subthreshold. In the subthreshold regime, the very interesting thing is that, you know, the transistor, be, you know, although it's a field effect transistor, it behaves like a bipolar transistor in the subthreshold regime. So the current and voltage has an exponential relationship like you have just like in a bipolar. And the nice thing about it, as you will see later, is that it becomes geometry independent, which is good. So you can use very, very low cost, you know, sort of fabrication techniques for that. And so, you know, so this is what we call the uh, transfer characteristics of a transistor. Transfer because you're looking at the output drain current as a function of the input gate voltage. And from here, you get all the uh, parameters like threshold voltage, transconductance, you know, mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is on a log scale. And if you were to point out where the threshold voltage is, it sits somewhere here. Um, just before it goes off to the very, to the on state. 
this on state is well above threshold. In other words, well, you know, gate voltages have to be higher than the threshold voltage, and that defines the on state. And that on state is a function of how big the drain voltages are as well. But if you went the other way, here is the sub threshold, and then you approach the leakage. Now, this is very interesting, right? Here I show you something like minus 13. Now, this leakage current is, is you know, this is the best we can do for measurement of the, of the leakage current. In other words, the noise flow of the measurement sets the value as minus 13. That's, you know, using the best um, Keithley, you know, instrumentation, we are able to get 10 to the minus 13. I'm sure you can do slightly better than that maybe minus 14 or maybe even minus 15, although some people do claim that. But if you, if you integrated that transistor with a circuit in situ and use that circuit to measure the off current, people have reported you know, values of 10 to the minus 21 amps per micron. Per micron means per transistor width. So you can see that it's really a low current that you can achieve, which means there's so much headroom to be able to process very low, you know, levels of sensory signals because it's not going to be corrupted by the noise. So in other words, what it is, is that the noise is of the order of 10 to the minus 20 amps per micron of channel width. So that's that's that really is quite interesting. And this is this is true only for white band gap semiconductor. If you took silicon and a silicon sensor interface would sit somewhere here, 10 to the minus 11 at best, or maybe 12. So that's like eight orders of magnitude higher. And if you look at off currents, it's exponential with the band gap. So that's the reason you're able to get, you know, such low values compared to what you get in silicon. Now, so this is nothing new. I mean, we looked at it at the uh, thin film transistor level, but people have used sub threshold circuits from the 70s uh, and, and, they've have, and they've done all that in silicon. So the, the very famous symbolic um, announcement was in Journal of Solid State Circuits in 1977, where they used subthreshold circuits and they achieved the subthreshold by varying the body bias of a transistor of a MOSFET. And you can push the threshold voltage down. You can vary the threshold voltage by body effect. And, um, and, and by doing that, you know, you're able to operate in the subthreshold regime. And they built an entire circuit. And this is a, um, a low current because it's operating in subthreshold quartz oscillator circuit. And that's what you see in your Swiss watch, swatch. And um, this watch is, is quite amazing technology, you know, that was created back in the 70s. And what you do is, you know, one of these that you buy, I remember having owned that because I spent my postdoc years in Switzerland. You can wear that and actually the battery doesn't die. I mean, the watch dies before the battery and you know, you replace the watch, but the battery is still good. In other words, the watch consumes so little power. And if you, if you really ask me, you know, this is the, the so, sort of for the first wearable ever, <laughs> although it just gave you time, but you know, you could have integrated, you know, the, the idea is, you know, it would, would have been, you know, like what Apple is doing today. Uh, quite easily, you could have integrated biosensing functions onto that, onto this uh, wearable, uh, low power wearable. This uh, the the Apple is not a low power wearable. You you know, I hear stories of you know the iWatch having to be charged twice a day. As uh, you know, of course, it's going to improve with their own processor, etc. But but this was truly a low power wearable. Um, right. So. So let me now come with, uh, you know, so what, what really um, takes place in the, in the, in the uh, short key transistor that's made out of these oxides. So, uh, so it's a wide band gap material greater than three electron volts and oxides, these are basically, you know, like we talk about an oxide like silicon oxide, you all know what silicon oxide is. You also all know what indium oxide is. 
Now, silicon oxide has a band gap of 11.9 electron volts. It's, it's very large. And it's very hard to get conduction out of that because of this huge band gap, but it's a very good insulator. Um, but if you went to indium tin oxide, that's very much a conductor. So that's used as electrode material. In virtually every solar cell, you know, on glass, you can deposit at low temperature. So that's an oxide as well. So oxides are not new, they've been around. And if you, you can take that indium oxide, you know, system and modify that, you know, by adding, by adding um, zinc or by adding gallium. And what you will then get is a, a classic material that's used now in all of the tele televisions, uh, organic, organic TVs or, or in liquid crystal or LCD televisions or even laptops, right? And that is the indium gallium zinc oxide. So it's an interesting system. It's a, it's a difficult system because it got four elements in it. Uh, but it's a very nice white band gap material. And uh, you can change its conductivity by controlling the amount of gallium you put in that, right? So we're not going to get into that material science, but you know, the summary of, of that system is uh, zinc gives you very good conductivity. Gallium suppresses that. And uh, you, you need that suppression to get the stability of the material. Otherwise it becomes light sensitive. And so what gallium does is it brings the mobility down. So if you look at that system, I have, I have indium, I have gallium, I have zinc, and I have oxygen. And essentially the, the zinc and the gallium, you know, do the, you know, the oxygen from there is what gets the compensation to get a more stable material. But, but, varying, but by varying the gallium, you can change the work function of the material, right? And so you can get, you know, an ohmic conduction source and drain all the way to a short key, uh, sort of a short key barrier source and drain. So, um, so if you look at the, uh, the band diagram, this is what it is. You see the short key barrier. So the injection, you know, it's, so it's, you know, you, you get injection by thermionic means you can get injection by tunneling. So they have two or three different types of mechanisms that take, you know, that bring carriers into the channel. And um, so we don't really worry about that. All we know is that we get an exponential characteristic in the injection properties, like what you get in a bipolar transistor. So here are, here are some measurement uh, results on the uh, short key versus ohmic. So here is, for example, the, the drain current, and that's, you know, plotted as a function of uh, gate voltage. It's not indicated there, but it's gate voltage. And uh, this is uh, different levels of compensation that take place on the material. And so you can see that there is a big, you know, difference in the subthreshold slope and in the uh, nature of the uh, output characteristics, simply because you've controlled the conductivity of the channel material. So going from ohmic all the way to short key. And so this is the transistor characteristic you're probably most familiar with. So this is current, drain current, as a function of drain source voltage. And you can see in a standard transistor, and these are probably the transistors you've you know, been quite used to seeing, you can see that how channel length uh, plays a role. Uh, so this characteristic you see here is for the 20 micron channel length. And then this is for a 10 micron channel length and it gets worse as you make it narrow and narrower. So a five micron channel length, you, uh, you will get further dependence, right? And increased dependence on, on BDS. In other words, the current, I drain source current is becomes a function of the drain source voltage. You don't get that independence. But if you look at a short key, so this transistor is a short key characteristic, gives you a short key characteristic. You can see now, you know, it's not as nice and smooth as you get in an ohmic transistor. You can see very clearly the short key. But what it gives you at, at these drain voltages, once you get saturation, you get very stable characteristics that are independent of the channel geometry. So if I were to plot that, you can see now drain current as a function of channel length, and I get virtually something that's quite independent. So in other words, I can make a transistor that is huge by printing 20 micron or by lithography to five micron, 
I should get the same characteristics. So that that was what was quite exciting. And um, and so when we saw that result, we said, great, you know, why don't we just go ahead and print a transistor using materials that are, for example, available, you know, in the standard, you know, um, you know, a standard supplier of, 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 of uh, organic materials for transistors, like Sigma All Rich, for example. And, uh, and we had an old printer and we said, let's take that and, and, and create this uh, white band gap material and then try and print it. So that led to the next uh, progression of the next sort of sensor interface that was done by printing. So uh, I, I think I've explained uh, this already to you. So, so this is the regime of interest, the deep subthreshold regime, which is really uh, the near off state of the interface. So that now brings us to the uh, organics. Uh, organics are nice because they are solution processable, they're mechanically flexible, they are multifunctional as well. You can use them for sensory applications and you, I'm sure you are now seeing, you know, flexible sensors, the conference that Professor Dahia runs in Glasgow, uh, IEEE FLAPS meeting, that's all on, on, on flexible sensors. So, uh, so flexible sensors are, uh, are uh, becoming a very, very important thing. And for that flexible sensor, you will need a flexible interface. So that's an important requirement that goes with it. So this is a just a very cheap, you know, uh, ink, ink dispenser essentially. I mean, I could this. I think I remember having bought this for about thirty-five thousand pounds. That's what it was. Uh, it didn't give you a high resolution, but for proof of concept work, it, it it's great. It, I think it does give you just several microns as best at best. So. Um, and 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 um, and the thing to to note that which I did not mention yet is that um, the um, at subthreshold operation because the currents are very low, the signal frequency response at best is about a hundred hertz, you know, uh, with these transistors because high frequency. If you want the device to work at high frequencies, you got to drive it to high currents. And uh, simply because you want to overcome all kinds of internal capacitances, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what, you know, gives you the high frequency response. And if you reduce this current, uh, capacitance, of course, you know, in that device plays a role and the best frequencies you can get are about 100 hertz. But when you look at a lot of these bio applications, even 100 hertz is, is a lot. So. So frequency response that's well below 100 is, is good enough for biosensing applications. Now, the one thing I did not mention when I showed you the Swiss watch, Swatch, um, that, that did not need a, a, you know, a good frequency response at all. Of, to keep time, all you need is one hertz. As long as you want you know, a single second accuracy, one hertz would work sufficiently well. So going, going beyond that to, to several tens of hertz is, is not an issue at all, but it satisfies that requirement of keeping time. So, so that whole idea, right, of bringing the currents down also means I'm, I've brought my frequencies down. So, but in bio applications, it's fine. So here is an all, you know, an inkjet printed low voltage organic transistor. Now this is, uh, this is working in the ohmic regime. And uh, the reason I showed you this is um, the one important thing that we, that came out of this work, which was published in 2016 in Organic Electronics, the, um, the, uh, the interface state density. So when fabricating this, so this was um, on a PEN substrate, this was a silver gate electrode, printed gate electrode. And uh, the whole structure was printed uh, by that printer that I just showed, and was encapsulated by uh, Cytop, and the active channel region was a tips pentacin polystyrene blend, and the key was, you know, getting the uh, process steps, you know, right for this interface uh, with the dielectric. So this is a, you know, PVP dielectric, and that interface, by careful control of that interface, we managed to bring DIT down to very small values. So you're looking at, you know, 3.62 times 10 to the 11 
uh, for the interface state density associated with the uh, associated with that transistor, and that was very important because when you when you bring down the density of interface states at the semiconductor insulator junction, then what you do is you also bring down the voltage. So you can get very low voltage operation because the voltage drop across that interface has been minimized. So that's a very key point. And if you look at the silicon MOSFET, you know, uh, thank God the uh, insulator was a silicon dioxide. So silicon, silicon dioxide forms a perfect marriage in the sense that the interface state density can be really super low and it, and it tends to be 10 to the 10 is about 10 to the 10 or less, you know, so, so this is an order higher than that. So, so, you know, so what I'm trying to show is that interface state density becomes a very important parameter, whether you make a sensor out of printed transistors, or whether you make a sensor interface out of it, to get a low voltage operation, you need to bring down interface state densities. So, so uh, how does it compare with other inject printed uh, organic transistors? So here is the interface state density, but you can see the other, you know, sort of devices that have been reported. Some don't worry about reporting it or measuring it, uh, but certainly, you know, it's, 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 it's higher, in, you know, close to 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13. And um, so with this reduced interface state density combined with a larger gate dielectric capacitance, you can achieve a steep, you know, quite a steep subthreshold slope of 155 millivolts per decade. That this, this number just tells you that I've got a good interface, you know, and this is what um, the silicon world tries to, tries to achieve. So here's the fully uh, printed Schottky barrier transistor. So what you saw earlier was the ohmic, but the whole idea behind the ohmic was to try and figure out what best process steps one could take or use to reduce the interface state density. And so, so this is the, um, so now we've gone to the Schottky where we have a very wide band gap semiconductor. So this is a C8 BT BT polystyrene and uh, and that's a wide band gap material and a wide band gap material tends to like i mentioned gives you a low off current so so here is a variation of subthreshold slopes um you know uh from very you know from a number of these fabricated devices i mean the variation is that you're looking at about 25 to 30 percent or more or less you know variation in subthreshold slope variation in threshold voltage as well so now this, this 25, 30%, whatever. So this is a number that's very common in thin film technology. Even in the new generation of MOSFETs that we have now for digital, um, for high-speed digital logic, you do have such variations, but you try and absorb all of that in the noise margin. And so in the analog case, you know, this kind of variations would require compensation, which is what you know, these displays are all about, they're fully compensated. Okay, so then, you know, when you plot the uh, drain current of these uh, devices as a function of gate source voltage, you can see that the output characteristic is flat. Just like I mentioned earlier, you know, for different channel lengths, it's, it's invariant. And uh, this flat output characteristic gives you an infinitely high R out. A large R out means my internal gain can also be very large. So GM times R out gives you the internal gain. So whatever low sensory signal that comes in, it does get a good boost. And at the output of the sensor interface, you can have a large enough you know, signal. Now in this particular case, the short key does give a, a good subthreshold slope as well. Here it's 60.2 millivolts per decade you know, just indicating that I've got a very good, you know, interface right at the, uh, for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the channel uh, insulator interface, right? So, so here are the intrinsic static parameters of that printed transistor. So here is GM that's shown in red. And you know that the transconductance usually is extremely small in these kind of uh, devices. And then here you have uh, R out, which is the output resistance. And this output resistance 
is is quite high. So you, you can see now at 0.1 gate source voltage is about 10 to the 13. That's how the output resistance is, simply because it's so flat. And uh, flat, and uh, this is a property that you do get in the bipolar transistor. Bipolar transistors were attractive because they did give you, you know, for large enough base widths, they did give you a voltage independent uh, output resistance. And so in, 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 in sub-threshold operation, because it's, very, it's all, uh, you know, transport is diffusion dominated, you do get the same sort of properties or characteristics of the bipolar. So essentially then, you, here's where the silicon MOSFET sits for intrinsic gain. You're lucky to get something close to, to uh, 10. And then, um, and then here's where Schottky barrier, you know, oxide transistors are. And this is where the organic transistor is simply for that sole reason of reduced interface state density. And what it does, it's, you know, you can see that it's hitting the Q over KT limit, which is the theoretical limit. Theoretical limit for the, um, you know, transconductance efficiency is Q over KT, which is what the bipolar device used to get. Now, so coming to noise, because the noise ultimately um, uh, limits the resolution of the sensory signal that, that you're trying to, um, you know, detect. And, um, and so that noise in sub-threshold is amazingly low, simply because the currents are low. So noise, this one over F noise, because we are in the low frequency regime, and one over F noise is, 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 uh, is the main source of, you know, um, noise that limits the resolution. So you can see that here's uh, the noise measured at different currents. And um, you can see how the noise basically degrades or, you know, essentially, if you look at this green curve, essentially, you know, the noise the one over F corner frequency is extremely small and thermal noise then dominates. So here is the, um, so we're taking this output noise, referring it back to the input. So this is the in input referred noise and uh, essentially on this scale. And um, you can see that, you know, you know, we are looking somewhere here. This is a single noise ratio in dB. And here is the resolution equivalent input, you know, noise. In other words, we can tolerate, uh, if you're in this regime, which is where we are, we are very much close to 100 nanovolts, right? So a, a sensory signal that is lower than 100 nanovolts cannot be resolved, but anything above 100 nanovolts, you know, you are able to resolve. So here's the printed amplifier and the EOG signal signal uh, capture so you can see that i mean so so just to have something quite simple that we can demonstrate so here's a simple circuit that was built with the short key transistor and um, and essentially it's like it's just like a source follower and basically the the sort of intrinsic gain one is getting is about 260 volts per volt that's the gain and um, and the signal resolution is somewhere, we are sitting somewhere here, it's about 3.8 microvolts for a hundred hertz bandwidth. So, so, um, so it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the testament lies here in, in the sense that here is a EOG signal. So that EOG signal is extracted by putting electrodes across the eye because those electrodes um, sense the position of the eye. Um, and this was something we just did a quick experiment to see, you know, whether they can do eye, you know, if you want to do eye movement tracking, which may be of interest in, um, you know, virtual or augmented reality. And, um, and that's what we found that the unamplified signal versus the amplified signal, you can see a very clear, you know, um, signal, um, signal character from that. And so, and this represents, you know, the, 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 the positive peak represents looking up a negative peak represents looking down and looking straight basically doesn't give you a, a signal. So, so these are extracted, these are corneal retinal potentials and they're extracted from right across the, the, the sort of the eyeball. And the type of signal noise ratio we get out of this is something like greater than 60 dB. Right, I think I will, uh, we have, um, 
got about 45 minutes. So I think I'll skip this and go straight to conclusion so that we can then have a time for discussion. Right. So, uh, so newly emerging materials are very interesting and materials now are very easily brought into the, uh, you know, into the device picture to make new sensors, to make new transistors. And, uh, and, and, and the ultimate example is what's going on in the silicon industry in the uh, fabrication in, in, in the heterogeneous integration where they are using even this organic or oxide materials being seriously considered because of their low thermal budget to be put on anything that is CMOS. So it's, it's becoming very interesting for 3D integration and uh, simply because, you know, uh, because of their low thermal budget. And, uh, and that low thermal budget also means that they can be layered easily on plastic paper. You can have them disposable, recyclable. And, um, and uh, for a sensor interface, um, so this is where I'm coming from, the white band gap oxide or the organic materials are naturally suited. And they're also, uh, you know, they're suited for two reasons. One is for the low, you know, sensory signal they can resolve. And the other is for the low power. And uh, subthreshold operation brings the best of the FET as well as the bipolar transistor walls. So you have low power and bias independent performance. So that's the interesting thing about a, you know, a subthreshold sensor interface. Right. So these are the guys who actually did the work. We had, you know, virtually students from kind of all over the world and, uh, and uh, who came for their PhDs. And these were the sponsors who paid towards the, the research. And I think with that, I, I stop here and take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Arukia. It's a very nice talk and uh, sharing your you know, latest research with us. So now the floor is open for questions. So please feel free to ask any questions from the audience. Hope it wasn't uh, overly technical. Uh, no, it was really good. I actually have one. So the, the noise figure, what you have shown mm -hmm. is really, really low. So mm -hmm. what type of special instrument do you use for measurement of such a low yeah. noise? Right, right, right. So the number one, um, you have to build a shield uh, for noise measurement. So especially low frequency noise, the, the, the you know, the, um, the shield has to be the kind of shield that we use. I mean, it's a very thick copper box that we build. And inside that copper box goes all the, um, the, um, um, the instrumentation. So and the instrumentation, you need a, a, a super low noise um, amplifier. So in this case, you know, if you're measuring the drain current, you need a charge amp, a very low noise charge amp, the best in the market. Mm. And they're generally made out of, you know, uh, gallium arsenide technologies or whatever, and super well um, thermally compensated. So you get very stable uh, amplification. And then uh, the biasing for the transistor is done with batteries. So we actually buy something like car battery equivalent. Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, so that, you know, if you take a Duracell and measure the noise, it's horrendous. The noise coming out of a Duracell battery is really yeah. bad because the amp power is small. So the voltage out to the amp hour ratio has to be as small as possible. Yeah. All right. So car batteries are nice. So, so you bring all that, you put that into that copper box and then you take it out. That copper box has to be designed to allow some kind of an antenna thing for uh, electrical feed through to yeah. be taken to the outside world. And then all of that, that copper box has to be shielded by a new metal box. Because in the atmosphere is made up of uh, magnetic fields and electric fields. You want thick copper so that you can provide the box we had was 150 dB of attenuation of the electric field in the EM. And uh, the high permeability magnetic shield does not allow magnetic fields to get in. It just hovers around the box. Yeah. And uh, these magnetic fields, once they get in, any kind of vibration can induce a current or voltage, right? So that's the reason we don't want any of this magnetic fields. 
So that's the, the only way to be able to then get the high resolution measurements that we need. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, that one thing you could not cover due to time, the flexible thing. So when you mm. actually design the silicon, the dimension mm. is, of course, uh, you go for nanometer scale resolution. But in the flexible sensor, which uh, which you are going mm -hmm. to present, but due to time, so what what is the restriction of the dimension in the flexible material? Uh, there is no, there is no. Whether it's one micron or ten micron, I don't think um, you know mechanical flexibility. The range, with, you know, in terms of the bending radius, yeah, right, yeah, the bending radius, you know, quite easily accommodates. But do you need any special proper. instruments for that, for, for manufacturing or for no, making? No, what I did, did the, the flexible transistor I showed was by printing. Okay, so it's called it's by printing. printing. But how do yeah. you make the different material, like layered material? Yeah, we just print one material above and the then, next, above the next, above the next. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right, right, right. So, uh, for example, hang on, hang on. Right, so here we go. Yeah. So you can see um, the silver, printing silver is very straightforward. It's so well established now. So you can buy silver inks from Sigma, Sigma Elrich, you yeah. know, reasonably pure. And the first thing you do then is you print the gate on top of a substrate. So here we use the PN substrate. Then we printed the gate. And then came the dielectric. Then on top of that gate, we printed the PVC oh, electric. Okay. Right. And then on top of that, what we then did was printed the source and drain silver electrodes again. So we printed silver electrodes and they, was, they were separated by whatever minimum that the uh, printer can accommodate and oh. that printer can go down to as much as 40 microns. Oh, okay. 40 microns. Right. So is right. there any limitation on the size, Arokia? How, size how big no. you could print? A print is uh, uh, size doesn't matter. You know, okay. you can actually make it reasonably large, right? So, um, and then you print the uh, the channel material. This channel material is C eight BTBT polystyrene. Yeah. You just kind of print it over there, and but it's printing, right? So it's not a continuous channel material. So you start there and you finish there, and yeah. then you print the side top above everything, right? So, and how do you how do you include that electrodes? For the through gate, the, uh, substrate, and yeah, through, through the through, through the silver. So you got to, and I don't show you the top view, but you got to bring the electrodes out of the uh, transistor, like you would do on silicon design. Same. Oh, okay, same. In, in principle, yeah. So is it you do during the fabrication stage, or you later on right. you add them? Fabric no, during during fabrication, you have to allow the electrode to come out to have access to the electrode for oh. fan out. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and one more uh, thing, Professor, uh, yeah. how uh, your printer can have all these inks, uh, it is compatible with yeah. your printer, like pen is a substrate, PVC, how you give it an in ink form? Right, so they are in ink form and I think you have enough nozzles in this, in this printer that allow you to do that. So there are sufficient number of nozzles. Uh, and, um, and what you do anyway, if, if there are insufficient number of nozzles, if you need even more, so between printing layers, what you can do is try and uh, replace the nozzles with the new material you want to print anyway. So you could also do that because you have to uh, give it some drying time as well to form, especially at interfaces, it becomes very sensitive. Uh, and you have to allow some 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 degree of some drying time, right? So, yeah. But technically, it's no problem. There is sufficient number of nozzles to handle liquids of different kinds. So, first step is to prepare all these different liquids, you know, inks, mm. and then you know, I think, and then independently, each ink has to be well characterized well characterized for his, uh, you know, optical, electrical, mechanical properties and all of that. And then once you're happy with the ink, you then go ahead and, uh, you know, you can then use it in the printing. So even still something as simple as silver inks, there's a lot, there is an art 
to, yeah. to try trying to get it right, right, and yeah. then make sure that it sits and you know adheres to a surface. So that's you know surface properties also become very important. Yeah. Yeah. PN is just a ready-made substrate. We just cut it, yeah. and um, you can just you know have it on any uh, any rigid substrate for this. Yeah. And what is the size of one transistor here in Figure A? The size is typically, uh, it's going to be about several hundred microns by several hundred microns, or maybe 100 or 200 by 500, something oh, okay. along these lines, you know? Yeah. Okay. So they can be millimeter size too, it's no problem. Right? Mm -hmm. This is an ink dispenser, not okay. truly a printer, but it dispenses ink. You know? mm -hmm. I have got one question, Sarukia, from mm -hmm. chat. So what factors of this technology is hindering it from widespread applications slash mm -hmm. manufacturing? Printing mm -hmm. cost, instrumentation circuit, or what? Um, I think the, um, the ultimate, uh, what's restricting it is, I think, the test of reliability and really? lifetime. With yeah. time, okay. Because, okay. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, when you take silicon, and you take the silicon integrated circuit, uh, transistor and all that, it's gone through the test of time in the sense that the testing procedures on silicon are extremely rigorous. Yeah, you know, yeah. Extremely, extremely rigorous. And it's got to pass so many thousands of hours for this, so many, you know, this kind of temperature cycling, this kind of humidity cycling, and all of this, right, uh, has silicon has gone through that. But organics have not, you know. So you, you mean the, it's a matter very of time, new... as you said, 30 years, oh. so it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, you know, more and more work needs to be done. And um, so the one maybe possible area is disposable. You know, you use it and you don't want a lifetime associated with it. You just dispose it, for example, yeah. you know, after, after use of several rounds. So this is maybe how you start off with. And then I'm you trying yeah. and it withstands, you know, many hours of operation. Yeah. yeah. Anyone has got any questions from the audience? Hmm. Yeah, just a follow up. It's quite late in Sydney now, right? <laughs> it's... Uh, so he, uh, he has added, what's the typical decay of organic transistors? Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I, when I was looking for my files, I became very desperate and I had actually uh, results to show the degradation, you know, in these transistors was actually very small, less than 10% over you know, months, three months, four months. In fact, you know, when we sent it away for publication, the reviewer came back and asked the question about something and we had to go back and measure it and we could measure it very precisely again after three months. Okay. And the, the reason why there was no degradation, two reasons. One is you had the encapsulation that always helps protect it from the environment. And number two was that the degradation is also often induced by the amount of current you put in and so, so any kind of shift in characteristics was, uh, was, was minimal simply because the currency, the device had to handle were very small. So that's the other. So in other words, you know, with these materials, having a current flow through them is already stressing them. So you want to, you know, for low voltage, low current operation, it's sort of, you know, helpful um, in the sense of, you know, you're, you're, you're staying away from high stress, so to speak. So the variation with um, uh, bias stress is actually very small, uh, mm. depending on the size of the bias stress, of course, right? So, but and for these kind of operating conditions, it's very good, yeah. So I've got one more question, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So if we apply in digital circuits, mm -hmm. is there any latency issue for real-time communications? Yeah, definitely. So this is a technology that is very clearly only for sensor interface, uh, not, and not for digital. Yeah. Not no. for communication. Hotkey is the last thing you want for digital because you can 
you know, the best you can do is 100 hertz, so to speak. Yeah. You can design it for larger currents, but, you know, it's a becomes, you know, digital requires high current and high current means high power. So if you want to send wearable sensor interface, you know, what you tend to do is um, just stick it to the analog. And if you want, I mean, there are this uh, very low power Bluetooth chips that have come out in silicon. So you can always the interface to one of these very low power devices, right? So. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. So I think uh, because of time, I think we'll make it end of the talk here. So I would like to take the opportunity to to thank you very much, Arukya, for your time and sharing your interesting and high end research profile with us. I just have one more one more last question. Yeah. So you told yeah. that you are no more no more working with the university. You are having uh, this company. So yeah, are you company. are you are you Ha, you, because the company will have very difficulty to have high-end instrumentation and high-end manufacturing technique. So wh what do you do for, on that front? Uh, you have to raise enough investment. Wow. And, wow. Uh, yeah, 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 you have to. And, uh, you know, so this is where you draw the line in the sense that what is the investment I need to do mm -hmm. in-house work to generate new intellectual property? Okay. Right? And uh, what is the work that's involved, which I can outsource where I don't care about the IP. In other mm -hmm. words, there is no new IP, it's textbook IP, let's say. Yeah. And then you get that outsourced. So for high-end measurements, you know, if it's just routine testing and so on, then you just ship it out. Yeah. Uh, have a, so in other words, you know, like environmental testing, you can do it in-house because that's not very expensive environmental testing. Yeah. But if you don't have the room, you can ship it out. And I've done that many times, you know, for a few thousand pounds, you get the full industrial spec, um, you know, sort of performance, you know, on the, on the reliability. So, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you very much for sharing. But otherwise, that. you need the investment. You need investment to get the, all the facilities. Now, yeah. here, in this particular case, the fabrication is very, very expensive, right? So um, if it's printing that you're going to go for, then you have to build yourself a little uh, printing station, which yeah. will easily be, uh, by the time you're done, it will be about 50, 60,000 pounds. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's what I... Yeah, no, thank you very much for sharing that. That is really interesting. So yeah. anyway, so everything was very interesting and everything was very, very helpful. And especially the people who are working on sensors and trying to fabricate. So that's a very good information for them. So on behalf of the New South Wales Sensor Council chapter, I would like to again extend my heartiest thanks, uh, Arukya, for your time and sharing your research activities uh -huh. with us. And I Pleasure. hope that you have got the whole day. So wish you a very nice and good day. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll end the meeting here for everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.